All right. Hey guys, welcome. My name's Nathan. Uh, I work here at PencilWorks. I'm the community developer, and I'm talking into a non-working mic because we're broadcasting live. It's totally on. Um, so uh, welcome to the space. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the intent for the evening. Uh, uh, there's a lot of different people here from a lot of different like sides. Some people are developers, some people are not. Some people um, are familiar with, with simply Bitcoin and a lot of people don't know about Ethereum or the space. Uh, some of it, um, so this is kind of like an organic like conversation that was meant to facilitate a community uh, around these technologies. So PencilWorks um, is focused on empowering all of these small businesses that you guys see around here. Some of them are software companies. Some of them are uh, news sources. Uh, there's a mortgage company behind us. So um, all of these are potential use cases for the technology that we're talking about. Um, most people on the floor know me as that weird tech guy who they don't know what he's talking about most of the time. Um, but I've, we're, we're sort of putting forth a lot of interesting ideas here. Uh, we're going to launch a digital currency to Greenpoint called Greenpoints, which is like a token, basically, that is attached to like our key fobs, um, meaning that we get to create a local digital currency that keeps uh, currency local to our community. So it's not extractive, um, and it facilitates local trade. Um, we're also doing events with fashion and uh, art. So we're going to be doing tomorrow night in Chelsea. There's a free event which is the first, uh, like the world first uh, event where uh, art and fashion is both trademarked and sold on a blockchain, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, and really that just serves to sort of empower people. Um, that's what the conversation here is about. Um, so you're going to see three different companies tonight. Um, our chain being one, uh, Aroha, uh, the company is called Soromitsu. They're a Japanese company built on IBM Hyperledger. Uh, and the third, which will, will come later in the evening, which is Bancor. Um, they'll be showing up probably around 8, 8.30. Um, and they're, uh, they're working to sort of bank the unbanked and to uh, empower people uh, in a new sort of fintech era. Um, so separately, our, our plug here is that if you want to be a part of our community, you can rent desks from us. You can rent office space from us. Just talk to me. You can look us up on pencilwork.com. Um, and then from the internet, uh, if you want to stay in touch with us about our local uh, digital projects, you can find us on, on, on Pencilwork, uh, on Twitter. And, and uh, again, my name is Nathan. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce Ed, and he's going to talk about our chain, uh, which is basically like Bitcoin 3.0. So here you go. Here's Ed. Thank you, Nathan. Um, yeah, again, my name is Ed Eicholt from R Chain Holdings, and uh, also wanted to introduce Navneet Suman, and uh, our cameraman, uh, Christian Pearson, and Greg Meredith will be here probably within a half hour. Very good. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'm going to tell you about a blockchain initiative called R Chain that is scalable. It'll be more computationally correct, and um, we have... A, a very great plans for this uh, blockchain. It's it's not the blockchain exactly like uh, Ethereum and uh, definitely not like Bitcoin. It's it's going to surpass those capabilities in ways that we'll talk about and and why it will. We'll we'll also talk quite a bit about. Um, one thing I think is very important. You know, we have a, a mixed background of expertise in blockchain, so it's it's kind of difficult to, um, you know target the audience perfectly because some of you uh, know Bitcoin and Ethereum very well and others are just getting started with crypto or, and so forth. So let's, let's just get a show of hand. Um, how many uh, have used a cryptocurrency? Okay, and so you all have wallets and then uh, how many are software developers or, or consider yourself pretty uh, technical with software? Okay, great. Um, so, uh, you know, there's there's several of you that didn't raise your hand. That's cool, and I I'll slow it down a little bit c from a software developer's perspective, and also round out and talk about some of the uh, business things. And if I go too fast, and especially if Greg goes too fast because he's he's a bright guy and goes very quick, um, just raise your hand and um, 
slow us down, ask questions, uh, inter interrupt, that's fine. We, have, we should have plenty of time. Um, so um, if, if we look back at um, the great innovations in the web, all right, it started out with TCP IP, um, just basic connectivity level. Before that was, you know, centralized telcos that had permanent channels between point to point. TCPI made it, um, uh, you know, a, a, a configurable connection, and that brought in a, a series of innovations, uh, AOA, AOL and email and corporate email networks and all that. And then the World Wide Web happened, and all kinds of innovations happened ar around that, and all kinds of new companies were spawned that we couldn't even imagine before. You know, in the uh, mid-'90s, you know, who could imagine that you would be using a computer on a beach, right? <laughs> and so that's the way that we have to look forward to cryptocurrency. How is cryptocurrency going to change the world? How are blockchains going to change the world? And, you know, your imagination can go wild, and none of us know exactly how long it's going to take for our imaginations to take hold and for um, these new innovations. But uh, everyone that's in the space of cryptocurrency believes that it's going to be a fundamental transformation on the order of the World Wide Web. And a lot of the ways I like to describe it is that blockchains build essentially a trust layer on top of the World Wide Web or on top of the Internet. And we'll describe how do, what, what does trustworthiness mean on, on top of uh, a decentralized platform. Um, and if, if we look at um, today's institutions and just general trend, um, you know, as the internet came about and the web came about, um, decentralization has been a general trend and there's lots of forces to uh, decentralize or disintermediate. Um, you know, essentially it was the, the peak of the, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the British, uh, you know, having, having colonies all over uh, the world in like 1917, you know, is kind of the, was the peak right before World War I, and then everything has been toward decentralization since then. And the um, web is accelerated, and cryptocurrency will accelerate it more as, as a force in that direction. And that's, uh, welcome. Um, and, and that's, uh, you know, there, there's always a place for centralized institutions. Um, but there's a big place for decentralized um, paradigms of, of working with each other. Um, so if we look at, you know, uh, what bureaucracies essentially provide and, and how people and businesses work together, it's through contracts, transactions, and records of those things. And think how many businesses are built around those principles, you know. Um, obviously your bank, uh, insurance companies, lending, and all kinds of other things. Um, well, if you can, and, and, and many companies are in this business, are decent decentralize those things and put those things either on public or private blockchains, then um, that there's a lot of efficiency gains. So both uh, in the sense of lowering just simply transaction costs, record keeping, reconciliation between two companies, but also entire disintermediation of companies altogether can also happen and is beginning to happen. Um, there's so much happening in the blockchain space. Uh, it's just impressive to keep up. Um, I uh, look at Coindesk.com regularly, um, was just at their conference called Consensus. Uh, Navneet was also there. Um, that was over at the Marriott Marquis, and it's so impressive uh, to see 2,200 people in New York uh, from and from all over the place um, meeting to talk about blockchain, the, the challenges with it, and the opportunities. Um, uh, obviously, New York being a large financial center, there were a lot of financials there. Um, the CEO of Fidelity gave a keynote and talked about how Fidelity is using blockchain and, and uh, experimenting with it and the challenge they're having. Um, uh, identity is a big issue for um, institutions that need to have know your customer uh, compliance and so there's all kinds of solutions around um, that are being developed around identity and so forth. But um, 
I don't know if you can read these back there, but just go to coindesk.com and any week, any day, you'll see major innovations happening. Um, central banks uh, toying around with digital currencies. Um, the the uh, British Royal Mint is going to issue gold contracts um, where uh, you can buy digital gold and uh, trade it and it will be instantly cleared and it'll be your claim to physical gold, right? So that'll be interesting. And this, all these things are just happening, you know, in the recent weeks. So it's, it's awesome. And so what's so exciting about blockchain is it makes a lot of these things, uh, contracts, transactions, records of them, programmable. And it makes, um, and, and, and more. So um, basically anything that's an asset you can record on a blockchain and guarantee that it has a unique record of its ownership. Uh, and that's really impressive. So blockchains are decentralized, so they run all over the world on nodes that don't have to be um, coordinated in, in an organizational sense, um, and they will come to consensus about the state of their data. And so this one of the key, you know, this kind of data, this the data of who owns an asset, um, this uh, trust in terms of like contracts between parties, um, money, obviously, uh, you've heard of Bitcoin and so forth. Um, the notions of identity and identifiers and authorization. Um, you know, you think about the um, centralized uh, institutions like VeriSign that gives credentials to websites that drive, you know, the HTTPS for uh, SSL and, and TLS authorities and certificates that can be on the blockchain you know so there's all kinds of disruption that can occur and and the benefits that are realized are cheaper transactions guarantee of transaction integrity uh, permissionless user access and so forth so because of these capabilities it's really poised to disrupt many industries and to to reinvent a lot of end-to-end -end, uh, either consumer to consumer or peer to peer workflows business to business, business to consumer. And, and a new phrase I hadn't even thought about before is consumer to business. <laughs> and um, uh, quite, quite awesome. Um, and so I'm coining this phrase from um, author William Ogiar, um who, who writes uh, The Business Blockchain, and it's an excellent book uh, on how blockchains are being applied to businesses in these kinds of areas, that it creates a decentralized trust layer over the internet. And so that's going to disrupt many industries. And it's um, just about any industry you think of, um, you can think of how blockchain would apply to it. It's, it's really fun to brainstorm and, and to talk to other startups uh, in all kinds of industries. There's been over $2 billion of investments available to the public. So you can think of them sort of like Kickstarter. But these are then immediately tradable. So um, uh, lately, uh, Tokens that are issued on um, Ethereum have been taken off quite a bit with, um, what are the most recent ones, Christian? Uh, uh, Gollum is pretty recent. Um, the one the other uh, day that raised $27 million Aragon in our Aragon, yeah, so storage. storage. Um, these are um, tens of millions of dollars raised in under a some sometimes a couple of days. Um, and so that's the level of interest of that's pouring. In, in some cases, less, <laughs> right? So it's truly impressive. Um, uh, many people think that uh, these, uh, these tokens and the price of Ethereum and Bitcoin, especially the last few weeks, is at a bubble. Maybe it is. Um, it seems like it is. Uh, it, you know, it's a highly speculative um, investment area right now, I have to say and, and, and warn you, if you will. Um, most recently, um, there's been a ton of buzz and activity in uh, Korea, in Japan, and in the Middle East. Um, that uh, a lot, uh, for example, Japan clarified some of its regulations to allow payments uh, in commerce in Bitcoin. And so, part of the reason the Bitcoin price has been shooting up the last couple of weeks is because that uh, a media blitz has been occurring in Japan, for example. Um, but then there's also a lot of um, just you ask experts in, in this blockchain space is what's happening and they don't really know because it's 
a worldwide phenomenon, and there's so many independent drivers of what's going on. If, um, so I had to update this chart uh, just today because it's changed so dramatically. The last, the last time I took a, a screenshot was just like a week ago. Um, uh, for uh, This is the Ethereum market cap, which is about $20 billion right now. Um, it's, it's just crazy. Um, you know, I think it in the last two days it's gone up like 30%. Um, what the crap? <laughs> um, so th clearly there's a, a, a lot of speculation, a lot of uninformed, you know, follow the pack and so forth, but there is something real there. It's just hard to evaluate, frankly. But be very careful if you invest in any cryptocurrency uh, that you could get stung because a lot of people feel it's at a bubble now. Um, so cryptocurrencies, blockchains are awesome, but they all have one big problem is they don't scale today. Um, and there's, there's other issues, but I'll, I'll simplify it and call it scalability. Um, the two major blockchains are Bitcoin and Ethereum. By market cap, Rip Ripple is right up there on number three and Dash, and there's some others. Um, but the primary problem is scalability. So if we look at, do I have a pointer? Oh. Um, so Bitcoin is about seven transactions sec a second. Ethereum is about 20. Our chain will be about 40,000 transactions a second. Um, and we've done some simple tests, um, but we are also um, building a fundamentally different type of blockchain, and I'll get into that. There's other differentiators like um, how the nodes in a decentralized system come to consensus about the state. Um, if we look back at Bitcoin and why it was such an innovation, it was really about the consensus algorithm. So you have these nodes all over the world, um, and they come to agreement on the state of the whole blockchain every 10 minutes. It's really quite remarkable, and Ethereum now is faster. Um, but how they do that was the innovation. It really wasn't the currency per se, because there were digital currencies before that, but it's the decentralized record of transactions and currency uh, and so forth that, that was the um, real revelation. Um, this notion of um, concurrency is really important when we're talking about scalability. So on a particular machine or a node, can you run uh, one contract at a time or can you run you know, as many as um, processor cores that you have? Um, our chain will, will be concurrent and, and allow many things to be run at one time. Programmable completeness. Ethereum is a programmably complete or also known as Turing complete programming language and virtual machine, our chain is like that as well. Welcome. Um, our chain will also support content delivery, unlike the other blockchains. So there's other projects working on content delivery, but they're kind of uh, once removed from the blockchain. Uh, Christian mentioned Storage as a project uh, that recently did an ICO that's working on a decentralized storage, and there's a couple of them out there. Our chain storage mechanism will build, be built right into that blockchain, so it's not a separate solution. Um, and then we'll support a number of uh, tokens or uh, cryptocurrencies on ours. Currently, we have a token called the Rock, which is an intermediate, essentially a coupon for the future cryptocurrency, which is called the Rev currently. We may end up uh, renaming the Rev to something else. Um, and our goal is to support multiple economic tokens, and that's a, that's a hard software problem, but we hope to get there as well. So kind of a way to wrap this up and think about it is our chain is going to support the transaction speed of the Visa network or, or China Pay, um, you know, very fast consumer uh, transaction speeds, and it's also going to support applications that deliver content at sort of the volume of Facebook and, and other social media. How, how can we make these claims with so, so confidence? Um, so a lot of this, uh, and we'll meet Greg in, in a few moments, but uh, Greg create, uh, created our chain's architecture and is building that, and it's built from blockchain experience, experience with the previous decentralized content delivery network, 
And then a lot of this is on the mathematics behind our chain. So uh, Greg is an expert in the area of mobile processes and the formal models around them. Um, so th there's a mobile process calculus, or calculi is a family, pi calculus. He invented another calculus called rho calculus, R-H-O. Um, and he he'll talk and take questions on these in more detail. Um, and then um, also the no uh, there's areas in game theory, which is really important to how the consensus mechanism among nodes will work uh, and, and how that will scale. And the basic idea is this, that if you build models that can be proven in the mathematics and then have a faithful translation from the mathematics to the programming language to the implementation and the virtual machine that run it, um, you'll have uh, fewer bugs and you'll have uh, sort of more provably correct software. Um, one of the, if, if you remember the a few slides ago, uh, one of those arrows on the Ethereum price was the DAO bug, which uh, happened like I think June of last year, which was a bug in a contract uh, in Ethereum. It wasn't a bug in Ethereum itself, but uh, a contract written in it for it, um, where they, they raised a, or created a project to raise funds to manage other projects. It was called the DAO. And it turns out this, that software contract had a bug in it. So it, they unexpectedly you know, um, raised about $150 million went into that contract. Um, and then uh, there was someone figured out how to exploit that contract and drain $50 million out. Um, so um, the Ethereum community was uh, faced with a, a dilemma they, they could um, sort of roll back the blockchain with software or they could let that go forward. They, the Ethereum Foundation chose to roll back that contract and create what, what they call a, a fork, a hard fork of that blockchain. And so now Ethereum excludes that transaction. There's another Ethereum classic that includes it, but that's kind of dying out. Um, so that was, that's a, uh, uh, an example of what can happen when you know there's a software bug at the scale of millions of dollars in a, in a financial infrastructure and a contract infrastructure that w eventually will be worldwide. So it's very important that the software is, is correct and so forth. So um, we've, uh, we've created the architecture and we're in the process of constructing it uh, and that will result in the R chain platform which is open source and and that's managed by the R chain cooperative organizationally we also have another organization called R chain holdings we've built out a roadmap and are beginning to build out business cases for applications on top of that so essentially R chain R chain holdings is an, an incubator and investor and we're going to create our own software to bootstrap this system and uh, solve end user problems. Okay, so we got the platform and applications side. Um, so another view of the organization, uh, I mentioned the R-Chain Cooperative building the platform. The R-Chain Cooperative is, is a member-driven organization uh, so that the proceeds from, um, or from the profits of the R-Chain Cooperative will be um, uh, they're called patronage dividends, and they will be sent to the members of the R-Chain Cooperative. There's a dues currently set at $20 uh, to join the R-Chain Cooperative. We're in the process of uh, registering on a per-state basis, um, so it's not completely open for membership yet, but will be soon, and um, we can talk more about that. Then there's um, the R-Chain Holdings, of which I'm the president. Um, we have an agreement between them where um, we will get, we have already received um, a <coughs> bunch of rocks uh, to help bootstrap this ecosystem. We have a cash payment or a series of cash payments that's due from holdings to the cooperative and then we're also coordinating a roadmap of the technology that will enable applications. Um, as I mentioned, we have portfolio applications and I'll walk through the sets of applications we're going to build first and uh, they will service uh, end customers uh, with products. Um, 
and then we ha we'll have a set of investors that we're pitching to. Um, on the platform side, this is a pictorial of the architecture. Um, I'm not going to go through this in great detail. I think I'm, uh, we'll put this back up when, when Greg is here, and he can talk about the platform in, in uh, more precise detail than I will. But um, let me just kind of repeat some of the benefits of what the architecture provides is um, the nodes will be, you know, s simpler to install than Bitcoin or Ethereum or others. Uh, the blockchain will synchronize faster. A node doesn't have to synchronize all transactions around the world, but the, um, there'll be, uh, in essence, multiple blockchains per node. So a node can support one blockchain or 100 blockchains, uh, and they're going to be organized hierarchically. Um, so, so there'll be some kind of um, uh, uh, leveling of, of nodes, if you want. So it, uh, one, one node may care about, you know, blockchain one, two, and three, and another one may be four, five, six, and then you may have another one that cares about one through six. Um, but what this means then is, you know, if, if you're buying a cup of coffee in New York, um, that transaction can be completely independent than if somebody is paying for, for rice and noodles in uh, uh, China, yeah. for example. Because, yeah, essentially the, the namespaces is the mechanism. I call them blockchains because it's a bit more uh, easy to, to relate to for some people. But essentially it's multiple namespaces um, will. And uh, Ethereum strategies calls this shards. They will uh, shard their blockchain in, in the Metropolis release, which is their next major release. But, but not quite the same way uh, we're doing. Um, sorry, this may be hard to read in back, but um, there is a long, long list of application possibilities and businesses that can be built on top of our chain. Uh, we know um, some of the things that we have to build first because um, they're, they're needed for user adoption and for these more advanced uh, functionalities. So we'll build out wallets, private messaging, content delivery, and some other things. Um, we are going to support um, the same kind of pseudonymous identity that Bitcoin and Ethereum support where you can be anonymous unless you reveal your public address. So um, many of the peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, scenarios and uh, usages will be, um, will be able to be provided with this pseudonymous identity. Um, but we'll also have um, a at sort of an attestation-based model where um, central institutions will need to, for example, say, um, you live at this address, you have this passport, you have this identity. Um, uh, and those are critical for business to business and, and business to consumer uh, scenarios. You know, if, if you're working with a bank and you're sending more than $3,000 within the US, each side of, of that transaction needs to know who the other side is by, you know, by regulation and law. Um, so those that, that's this identity um, uh, solution is, is really critical for us and I had several great conversations earlier in, in the week um, with some companies that are providing uh, those solutions. Um, let me just give you a use case. I thought it was such a neat use case someone suggested a few days ago which was this uh, consumer to business use case. Um, so um, in a lot of cities, uh, getting a bank account is challenging for, for many people, uh, in, in, uh, much of the, the lower income population. They just moved to the city, um, they, they've been there a month, um, they've paid their electric bill, but they're still having a hard time getting a bank account. Um, so th this is just one of this random idea, but okay, so what if the electric company put um, record of the electric uh, bill on the blockchain um, to um, that the consumer could choose to reveal to a bank and say, here's proof that I live at that address. I paid the bill, it's at my, you know, it's at my name and there's my address and the utility company um, wrote that record, I didn't. Therefore, okay, well that's, that's um, just one piece of the kinds of information that you need when you apply for, you know, further credentials or, or to a bank. 
that could be put on the blockchain and done much cheaper, much faster. So that's just, and, and that was the uh, consumer to business example that uh, I mentioned earlier. But that, I mean, that may sound simple, but there's just hundreds and hundreds of <laughs> these examples which are really exciting. Um, there's all kinds of revenue models uh, uh, on which these businesses can be built. The blockchain is it itself is going to be essentially pay for value or pay per transaction or pay as you go. That's the way that the uh, node operators get compensated for. Um, and so there's no, on the, the basic blockchain, there's not going to be any credit, right, or free stuff because then uh, since since it's not uh, un unless someone stands up a sponsor, but a true decentralized blockchain um, has to be pay as you go. But that doesn't mean that at the application level that there can't can't be sponsored uh, content, sponsored um, uh, pay paywall kinds of user models or freemium kind of models and so forth. So all of that's possible at the top. But at at the basic level. Um, there must be uh, the economic token paid for, and then there, our chain will also support, just like Ethereum has uh, secondary tokens, um, that and in Ethereum, these are called ERC-20 compliant tokens uh, is the most popular. Our chain will also have the second layer of tokens or application tokens. Uh, application tokens are exciting because um, they're a way to um, uh, collect a around a, community cause or a development cause. So uh, these that, that I mentioned, uh, Storage and Aragon and others um, are app tokens on Ethereum. Um, we'll have the same kind of ecosystem on our chain as well. Um, and so then uh, the application can charge in that token for its use and thus be a way for the projects to raise money as uh, not just up front and on the current currency or token issuance, but on an ongoing basis. And so these, if you think about, uh, you know, a great business model, uh, if you're uh, in business or look at it, is, is a subscription model where you have this stream of revenue that just comes in and that you can rely on. Well, that would be the ideal blockchain model as well for building a, an app where the smart contracts just generate a stream of tokens based on its use. Our initial portfolio, um, and this is uh, on the bottom, is the uh, our chain cooperative. Uh, we plan on a Series A investment to be closed uh, at the sometime during the third quarter, um, uh, and then we are going to hire ramp up, especially on the platform side. We expect an alpha in Q2 of 2008. Um, and the number of nodes on this network will grow. We expect the 1.0 release and the issuance or conversion of rocks to revs to be in the third quarter of 2018. Uh, and then on top of that, we're going to release a, a number of applications, um, what I call the basic applications, and um, that will include at least uh, a wallet application and messaging that is secure. And we'll also build out social applications on top. Um, initially, it, it will be a, you know, a better messaging application, but over time that'll grow to uh, content delivery as well, and then also content monetization. So the ability to, um, this is so different than the Facebook model, which is you know, ad-driven and um, uh, they make money by selling your data to other people. Um, this will be a, a private net private social network where you invite in your contacts that you want and the messages between you or among the groups that you choose to join are um, encrypted between between you so you know no um, government court that works behind closed doors um, can come to uh, us as our chain holdings and say give me Fred's data right well, we can give him Fred's data, but it's all going to be encrypted, and we're not going to have the private key to it, you know, Fred is, and so forth. Um, but also, um, this content can be monetized uh, in the sense that a content creator uh, uh, can um, charge micropayments for access to their content. So think of the public publishing industry. It's very dependent on, um, in, in the case of newspapers, uh, on classified ads. Um, 
that business went to shit because um, all the classified ads went to Craigslist and other online forums, uh, and they lost their revenue stream, uh, and plus the digitization of content. But then you go to like New York Times or Wall Street Journal and say, hey, I found a link. I want to read that article. Oh, please sign up for this one-year subscription. It's only $200 or whatever it is. Um, uh, well, now, so in contrast that with um, an excellent author, um, maybe a freelancer, and then a, a journal site that allows micropayments and a browser that you can control when you, when you spend, and then you spend five cents to get read that, okay? And it's done, <laughs> right? And so they have, they have a revenue stream. The author has a revenue stream, depending on how good their content is, and this could be anything s as simple as a newspaper article, a comic strip, uh, a you know, five-minute song, or a, an hour-and-a-half movie, okay? And you pay depending on how, how popular it is and how used it is. And further, if you're on the chain of promoting that content, hey, buddy, I, I just saw this great movie. I really suggest you watch it. You can get an incentive for promoting uh, within that network as well. So that's the kind of uh, social network and attention economy that we're going to create that will be monetized based on the incentives around your intent attention. Okay, so that, what happens to the old ad model? Well, it's going to be disrupted. Um, we're also going to build a marketplace um, around services and eventually around goods um, and a bunch of other applications as well. We're working out the details of what's exactly going to be happen when, but this is our intention. Um, we've make, made great progress. Um, I'm going to let uh, Greg talk in more detail about the um, platform side and where we're at. Um, we've participated in building a social network prototype, a services market prototype, marketplace prototype, and we have a pretty clear roadmap uh, and architecture of how we're going to do that as well. Um, we have an, uh, customer acquisition plans. Uh, the, these are, uh, we're, we're going to initially target those developers and those um, st startup entrepreneurs that are familiar with blockchain, right? So if, if someone is uh, into Bitcoin, Ethereum, and, and these other applications, they will immediately recognize the benefit of our chain as it comes to market. Uh, and, and even before, if uh, the, they're trying to build We've talked to a number of people at uh, Consensus a couple of days ago, for example, um, that uh, say, well, uh, here's my proof of concept. I'm building it out on Ethereum, but I know it's not going to actually get deployed there because in unless Ethereum fundamentally changes, we can't. We just can't meet the volume. We can't solve this problem. And I s said, well, let me tell you about our change. So that was an excellent opening, and it really made me feel great about the journey that we're on. Um, after targeting those application developers and entrepreneurs, um, we're going to, uh, especially on the R-Chain holding side, work with companies that are, are serious, they have a business case, and they're ready to uh, either have an existing startup or a new startup, and they want to work with us to learn R-Chain and for us to help them get started. So we're going to be an incubator as well as building these applications that we talked about in all kinds of areas. Um, in terms of promotions for customer adoption, um, we haven't formula formalized all this yet, um, formulated all this yet, but certainly um, the notion of social games as a way to get adoption is, is really important. There's a blockchain company in Seattle, for example, that um, they, they pay people in, uh, I think it's in Bitcoin, um, for doing an, an online uh, survey or downloading a game or those other kinds of things. Um, they're getting really great traction in India from this because, uh, sure, if someone will download for 15 minutes and get some fraction of Bitcoin, it's worth their time. Um, so there's all kinds of incentives that this that are essential s social games. And so especially when we bolt this on our social network, um, that this uh, network effect is going to be really important uh, for adoption. 
Um, we've considered uh, other techniques such as airdrops of tokens um, to specific communities, um, uh, and we're open to lots of discussion. My background is not marketing, and I know that customer acquisition, as great as our chain is, and as hard as our chain is to build, I also know that uh, customer acquisition for companies <laughs> is also quite a challenge. So any, any great marketeers out there um, on market and customer acquisition strategy, I'd love to talk to you about some ideas. Um, and then also we'll do advertising at, at launch as well. What happened there? Oh, it's a build. So how, how valuable is this? Well, if you imagine the, the value of Visa or Facebook or Amazon, especially on their cloud service side, um, they have staggering um, uh, market caps. We only need a few percentage points of these kinds of numbers to be a very profitable company. Um, so we're, we're quite excited about the opportunity um, and uh, we, we have all kinds, so there's all kinds of verticals to which our chain can apply, disrupt, re reinvigorate, and reinnovate. Uh, I'm going to skip that slide. <laughs> um, so uh, our leadership team is awesome. Greg will be here momentarily. Um, his background in mathematics is awesome. Uh, he also worked at Microsoft and was the principal architect for um, BizTalk, which is a um, business orchestration engine um, that uh, really reinvented the way that companies implement their workflows in inside and sometimes between businesses. And a lot of the same um, principles that were applied there in terms of uh, long-running processes that work uh, across servers, um, it's the same kind of mathematical thinking around um, mobile processes or, or communicating processes that, um, that are inspired by the same mathematics. Uh, my background is in uh, electrical engineering, MBA. I've worked uh, in uh, a lot of different kinds of software development projects, leading them in the role of product owner, or product manager, or technical program manager, and so forth. Uh, Navneet Suman, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, is uh, advisory services and consulting background. Uh, Navneet and Greg and I have worked together for over two years and uh, we uh, collaborate wonderfully. I'm very thankful for you, Navneet. Uh, and Evan Jensen uh, is an attorney uh, who has a master's or LLM uh, and he's gonna keep us out of trouble, especially when it comes to regulatory compliance, which is such a huge uh, concern for blockchain companies. Laws are real things, <laughs> so we can't just do anything we want. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's m the end of my presentation and would love to take questions. And please, um, so the call, call to action is we have two websites. This one is rchain.io, which is the holdings company. We also have rchain.coop, which is the cooperative. Um, on the cooperative, uh, there's a Slack channel which you can join and ask any question you want that you d didn't get answered tonight and feel free to email me as well. So what do you think? Let's take a few questions. Please. How would you uh, think you were to do 40,000 Awesome. Can you repeat that question? Yes, the question was how do we believe we're going to do 40,000 transactions a second? So um, the R-Chain blockchain uh, will be concurrent. Uh, it'll have a different consensus mechanism that will reach consensus across the network faster. Uh, and Greg can uh, describe this in a bit more detail with a bit more precision than I can. Um, the other thing is because we're going to support multiple blockchains that the whole world doesn't have to synchronize it itself. Um, the key thing about the uh, consensus algorithm, in addition to the things I mentioned, was that uh, most transactions uh, can quickly be ver verified that they don't have conflicts. They're not a double spend. They're not trying to do things in a different order. Most transactions are independent. So uh, most um, block commits don't even have to go through a 
a, a betting cycle in, in is what it's called in uh, Casper proof of stake um, to say, okay, so there'll be a series of propositions that aren't whole blocks, but it might be my node says, well, I had these four transactions, you know, A sent to B, B sent to C, D sent to E, and so forth, um, and that's my proposition for this to be included in the block. And so another node may say, well, I had these uh, 100 transactions, right? And another one says, I had these 1,000 trans, and so forth. Um, and so they, they um, the nodes, I, for, for my naive uh, characterization, they talk to each other and say, there's no conflict here. There's no attempt for double spend. We will commit it. Um, there's, um, there is, uh, uh, you know, a bonding and betting cycle and, and so forth where there's economic incentives for the node oper strong economic incentives for the node operators to be betting rationally and proposing rationally because if they don't, they will lose uh, money and their transactions will be reversed, you know, on, on a subsequent uh, block commit. Um, but that's uh, one of the differences. But so it's the concurrency, it's the, sh the multiple blockchains or multiple namespaces, it's the, it's the betting cycle uh, are how these all add up. Yes. Yeah, so the question was, uh, was the ICO with Scenario effectively the R-Chain ICO? Was that effective? So um, Scenario, uh, the company Scenario Limited, had uh, an ICO in like March of 2015, and then they had a second coin offering that was around September, October, November, maybe it's, I don't know if it went into November of uh, 2016. Um, uh, Scenario's token is called the AMP, AMP. It runs on the Omni network, which is um, on top of Bitcoin ultimately. Um, so Greg was with Scenario um, from uh, early, early 2015, I believe, um, through December of 2016. Um, and during that time uh, was the chief technology officer who um, specified um, a lot of the pieces of both the social network and parts of our chain at the time. Um, scenario uh, promoted during, during that period, especially on that uh, second coin offering in September 2016, uh, both value propositions, our chain and the social network. Um, my view of it is that the company overcommitted, um, and uh, they they promised to do two things, um, but uh, there was a falling out, frankly, uh, with with uh, Greg and Dor, the CEO of Scenario, um, and I'm not going to go especially on camera into details, but uh, ultimately there was a decision made to um, for Greg to leave the board and leave the company, um, and. Then um, in December uh, of uh, 2016, the R-Chain, uh, late December, the R-Chain cooperatives formed, and about a month later, the R-Chain holding company was formed. So, um, uh, so to answer your question directly, uh, my view is yes, uh, Scenario made a promise to its second ICO uh, purchasers of the AMP that they would build R-Chain. But then uh, just, uh, you know, two and a half, three months later, they removed their ability to deliver it. So um, they couldn't fulfill their commitment uh, to do both. So they, uh, my understanding is they're still committed to deliver a social network, but I, I don't know how and I haven't been following them. So there's been a lot of, uh, there's a lot of other color. Feel free to ask Greg more about that. Um, so after, uh, uh, let's see. So around Jan uh, late December, January, uh, in order to uh, honor th uh, those that had expected to be investing in our chain, Greg conducted a token, uh, what he called redemption process, yeah, where um, uh, those that held amps could redeem them or, s or swap them for the rock token, which is uh, a promise uh, or, you know, a, a 
coupon or re, uh, redeemable token that will be converted into the REV later. So that process concluded. It raised about a million dollars of funds for the cooperative. Uh, did I answer your main questions? Okay, uh, and happy to take more offline if you like. Alex? Yes. For rocks, yes. And also, of course, uh, there's a lot of ambiguity around, you know, how much to supply. You know, people have been asking on the, on the Slack, you know, what's going yes. on? Have been trying to, I know yes. there's some legal situations that you don't want to discuss that, but at some point, you're going to want to reveal some of that, right? To make that concrete so people can go out Yes, and yes, yes. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, let me try to summarize that for those on, on the um, video that may not, so I'll do my best. Um, so uh, this gentleman was saying that, uh, y you know, there's, there's some accountability that uh, the R-Chain leaders owe to the community and especially those that invested uh, and went through the redemption process and that now own. I understand. I understand. So I, I'll get to that. So uh, of how how uh, users will ultimately um, be able to uh, trade rocks, uh, uh, participate, invest more in rocks if if they uh, want to support our platform, and I'm uh, I and and then eventually the the conversion to revs. Um, you know, I think we should ask this question to Greg again. You know, because he um, when he arrives because. Uh, I can answer some of this, but not with the same authority that he can. I'm, I'm not an, an officer of our chain cooperative. I'm a director, but uh, I can't speak with a commitment, uh, but where he can. Um, so I, I understand your frustration, as you know, we've talked, um, but let's ask it again when Greg gets here. It's a very fair question. So you can participate in many ways. Buying a uh, token is one way, another is participating, how to build a platform, right? So I think uh, what the question you are asking much more focus on the token side, of the token side of the world. So I think what we are looking for, not only the participating marketplace for token, exchanging, buying tokens, and you know financing the platform, I think what we are looking for, the second side, where developers can come to the platform, <coughs> help us build the development. Yep. Yeah. See, again, uh, one of the, my point, Exactly. They support each other. They support each other. If you look at the fishery right now, there's no hype. There's an energy, there's an excitement that's happening, right? And to see, and there's a convergence of both of these. One, one energy can go to another. Look at, like, our chain. There's 400 members. Look at something like token card or whatever. Thousands, like, yeah. <laughs> in, like, two weeks, there's, like, a thousand members. Of course, yes. I definitely get your message. I hear you. You need you need to repeat this with Greg because, um, I, I, f fair enough. Um, so let me just re yeah recap again. So y your one of your points is that um, having a tradable token helps the projects in many ways, not just for the participation of those that are investing, but also f around the buzz, the community building, and so forth, and also to honor those that are actually uh, working on the project and that have to pay bills. So I get all of that, believe me. And let's ask Greg again, because uh, uh, I'm curious myself how he answers that. Um, other questions? In the back in red. Yes.
Yes, yeah, so the, the question was, as our chain goes into production, do we see uh, brand new dApps being created or dApps that were created for Ethereum or other blockchains um, migrating to use our chain and what do we see that ecosystem looking like? Um, I think it's gonna be quite interesting. Um, there's, uh, f first of all, uh, m one of the, one of the uh, panelists uh, today, uh, this was on the uh, incubator panel over um, at the consensus conference said, there's only one blockchain in production today and it's Bitcoin. And that, of course, the audience got all upset. It's like, but, but, but we've got all these pilots on Ethereum. And his point, the, his point was, they're pilots. They can't scale. They won't work at scale. Um, and so um, uh, I, I, basi I basically ag agree that um, real use cases are being solved with Bitcoin. Money is moving around the world. Um, in, in big, but uh, other than the speculation around Ethereum, the platform itself is mostly being used to uh, develop business cases, to build, build proof of concepts. Um, and uh, they will be extremely interested in our chain as we demonstrate we can scale. Um, the, it will require a re-implementation of the smart contracts from what was mostly written in Solidity to being written in Rolang. Uh, there's been people that have speculated, well, can't you build a cross-compiler or can't you run the EVM on rolling? I don't see that happening within certainly the first year and a half, but it's, it's theoretically possible to do those things. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I, I uh, hope we'll have the problem where we're going to have too many applications wanting to build on our chain and we can't keep up with them and it's going to be awesome. But how exactly and what sequence it's going to happen, I don't know. But uh, let me just give a, give a shout out for for those companies especially that that know that um, Ethereum or Bitcoin or other blockchains aren't going to really solve their problem. Um, please get in touch with us because we want to line up some of those commitments and the R chain holdings company especially will provide incentives to those companies that are uh, and, and startups that are serious about creating businesses ar around it. You know we have. Uh, a number of rocks uh, that we can provide as, as a mechanism incentive um, and sh uh, sharing roadmaps and, and cross-licensing among the, um, the holdings, uh, incubated startups and so forth. So we definitely want to strike up the conversations and so those agreements we can get in place early um, are going to be more beneficial than they will a year from now, you know. Does that, okay, another question in the back? Yes. Yeah, so the, the question was uh, to compare uh, our chain and supporting multiple blockchains with Trezos or Infinity or, and, and others. Um, I, I'll be honest, I haven't studied all the other blockchain projects. Um, I've, I've read, you know, sort of the summary as they come through. Um, uh, all of them are really after a lot of the same goals, you know, uh, scalability, um, some are going to be uh, perhaps more friendly uh, to institutions and in that they're going to be permissioned uh, and so forth. But which ones ultimately scale? Um, this is Greg. Uh, kind, of, kind of remains to be seen. And um, we, we b will deliver. And I don't know whether those will or won't deliver. Uh, it's, it's sort of the short answer. I need to go on hold for a second and take this call from Greg. Talk among yourself. Yep, we're good here, right? All right, so let me tell you a little bit about what Makoto is doing uh, with his company Soromitsu uh, in Japan. So as part of the Consensus 2017 and the Token Summit meeting that's going on this week, these guys flew in from Japan, which is currently in tomorrow, uh, to be here. So he came all the way from tomorrow. So this is going to be great. Um, He's w they're working on like so our chain is a lot of theory um, and not built obviously uh, but that doesn't mean it won't happen it just means that they're building the next big thing so uh, these guys on the other hand are are fully functioning 
Um, they're, they're working on IBM's Hyperledger on Sawtooth Lake, um, which is like totally in the open. It's in the wild. And these guys were recently hired to do the software for the National Bank of Cambodia, uh, which is a really big project. Um, he and I are also working together on a medical insurance project to reduce fraud. Um, medical insurance companies are being robbed basically like casinos. And so we're going to use their KYC AML knowledge in that zone um, to help reduce fraud. So uh, Makoto's experience is also in AI. Um, and uh, he's got a, a, a huge wealth of knowledge in that area. Um, so I'm going to let him sort of chat a little bit about what they're what they've developed and what they're doing and what their roadmap is in the future so i give it to uh, makoto this is just for okay great thanks uh can everyone hear me okay um so i'm uh when i move you over here i accidentally bumped the uh cable here and it got uh kind of knocked out so i need to um this thing's kind of uh kind of fragile so Let's see if we can't get it uh, working again. Yeah, it worked fine uh, a second ago. I think the cable has to be moved a little bit, so. You don't have another Mac adapter, do you? Uh, this one. This is mine. Yeah, that one, that's not USB-C. Oh, shoot. Well, let's, uh, uh, you can do, um, uh, you, need air, you can do airport. Do you need a Thunderbolt HDMI adapter, another one? Hmm? Uh, I have one in my bag. Let's do. Yeah, let's do this. We could try that. Uh, we can also try Wi-Fi here. Oh, it that looks. Working. Oh, uh, great. Uh, okay, great. So I'm I'm gonna be careful not to move this uh, again. <laughs> okay, great. So uh, I guess it's weird talking to Mike and not having speakers. But um, my name is Makoto Takemiya. I'm uh, the co-founder, co-CEO of Sorimitsu. We're a uh, fintech startup in Japan. So I'm in Tokyo, and uh, uh, just a little bit about myself. A little bit about myself. I'm a uh, uh, naturalized Japanese citizen. So I moved to Japan about nine years ago and uh, became a citizen two years ago. That's why I have a Japanese name, uh, Makoto. Uh, so a little bit about my company. So we created this company last year. Uh, the main focus was to work on digital identity. Without a digital identity, you can't have a digital economy, so it's very important to have some way to prove uh, who you are uh, in a uh, remote setting, like on the internet. And uh, so to do this, we wanted to use uh, blockchain technology. The reason being, it's a good way to create uh, digital certificates that are signed by some authority, and then uh, it's kind of like a, uh, a, a notary service. So someone notarizes these certificates and says, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is who you are. So. Uh, I'll talk more about that service later, but uh, that was the main reason why we started this company. Uh, and then to do this, we wanted to, we tried different uh, types of uh, blockchain software, but uh, none of them really met our needs exactly. So what we did was last uh, summer, we created a project called Iroha. So Hyperledger Iroha, we uh, open sourced it last uh, September and uh, it was accepted into the Hyperledger project in October. So uh, this is, I'll talk more about the platform later. But we're using this platform to do various uh, services. For example, we're doing basic economics research with the University of Tokyo, uh, University of Aizu, and uh, International University of Japan, uh, Glocom, which is a think tank. Uh, we're also working with a Japanese net uh, securities company, uh, Rakuten Shoken. And uh, we're also working with uh, the third largest uh, uh, casualty insurance company in Japan called Sumpo Holdings in order to uh, manage uh, uh, weather de derivative contracts. And then uh, last month, we announced a project with the National Bank of Cambodia to make a new payment system for the country. Uh, so I'll talk more about uh, some of these use cases. Uh, the executives of our, so I'm the co-founder and co-CEO, along with uh, uh, Okada. And then we have a, um, a chairman who's uh, Matsuda. So he used to work at a securities company in Japan. And uh, he, I don't know, does a lot of venture capital nowadays. Um, and then our chief operating officer, Miyazawa-san, he made a uh, digital currency in Japan called uh, Eddy. It, well, it's a NFC-based uh, payment. So he used to work at uh, Sony, and Sony developed a uh, Felica Type F uh, technology, and uh, that's used in. Um, so he was one of the creators of that, along with one other person. So they spun off a company, and then that became uh, Rakuten Eddy. Uh, it's bought out by Rakuten. So this digital money is used by 100 million people 
uh, in Japan, and you can use it uh, any, at any convenience store. Um, the same technology is also used in London, the Oyster card, and uh, in Hong Kong, the Octopus card. So it's used all over the world. Um, so uh, he, he left uh, Eddie in order to come work with us, mainly because uh, NFC technology has you know, certain limit. Uh, it's very expensive. It's very hard to get stores to buy a device to read NFC. And then, uh, so NFC is near field communication. And uh, it's, it's, it's really hard to build the infrastructure for this. So uh, using blockchain technology, it's much easier to build a, a simple and fast uh, payment system that uh, just is based on mobile phones. So I'll talk more about some of these cases we're looking at later. Uh, so we're a member of the Hyperledger project. The Hyperledger project is run by the Linux Foundation. Uh, has over 130 members right now, uh, including major banks and, and uh, even some government institutions. And uh, in the US, uh, Federal Reserve Boston is a member as well. In, in the UK, the Bank of England is also a, an advisory member. Um, so we're, we're, we're there from Japan. Uh, <laughs> It's hard to see our logo out of all these other logos, but um, uh, what we're all working together is uh, to build some kind of standards for uh, distributed ledger technology and uh, how digital assets can be managed. Because right now we don't have these standards, and, and that's a big thing that's holding back a lot of financial and uh, I don't know commercial applications on the internet. Uh, in Hyperledger, there's uh, actually th many different projects, uh, and inside uh, that. There's, uh, there's four different uh, distributed ledger platform frameworks. And uh, those are uh, Hyperledger Sawtooth, which was created by Intel, Hyperledger Idraha, which we created, Hyperledger Fabric, which was made by IBM, and uh, Hyperledger Burrow, which is, uh, uh, it used to be called Eris. Uh, so it's a fork of uh, Ethereum. And um, it, it just got accepted. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about Idraha. So we created Idraha to have, uh, I don't know, to really focus on mobile applications. So the architecture is designed to have really low latency and uh, you know, fast uh, finality for transactions. Uh, so that's, that guided our design principles because we were looking for mobile environments. So uh, if you go to a store and you want to pay some money, you, know, you don't want to wait uh, a few minutes or even a few seconds. You want it to be really fast. So within within one second, ideally, right? <laughs> so that's the, that guided our technological uh, uh, design decisions. <coughs> uh, because we're a small company, we're working with different use case partners. These are uh, different companies and uh, even a, a city in Japan uh, who are working with us in order to uh, kind of talk about different use cases. Uh, like, how can this technology be applied? So for example, if you're a city, you can do things like manage land titles or manage voting uh, in a, a very secure way. And uh, so that's, uh, these are some of the um, people that we talked to about, uh, you know, some of the use cases for this technology. And uh, it's hard to see, so it's really small. So some of the people involved are like Panasonic or uh, NTD Data um, or uh, uh, Mizuho Joe Soken. It's a child company, Mizuho Financial Group. So it's a different, uh, yeah, fairly large places. Also the National Bank of Cambodia. And for development partners, these are companies who've come together and said, we're gonna work uh, on this open source software for you, or with you. And uh, you know, we're gonna build this system together. And so there's six companies right now, including the National Bank of Cambodia and uh, Panasonic and NTD Data, CAC. So some uh, fairly uh, well-known places. So uh, we made Idrahad to be really mobile first. Um, so uh, this app uh, is available on the App Store. And uh, uh, in this app, uh, anyone can download it. It doesn't really have any value, but you have these like Idraha points. So this is just a sample app, so it, it just to demo the system. But uh, what you do is you, uh, you can scan a QR code and then type in an amount to, uh, to send. Uh, like like one Idraha point. And then I can hit send, and then uh, th the transaction is confirmed. So actually, that's about the speed it takes. The servers are in Tokyo, so it's a little bit slower here than in Tokyo, but um, it's pretty fast. It's less than a second uh, to send some, some money. So uh, this is the type of use case that we're really looking at and considering with, with Idraha. So to, um, to make it easy for uh, 
people to create apps like this. We, uh, we created SDKs for Android, iOS, JavaScript that let you do things like key generation and uh, digital signature generation on the device. You don't want to trust your private key with someone else. You want to do all the signing on the device itself. So that's really an important uh, uh, feature of this program, I think. So we're using this uh, technology to, do, uh, to explore various use cases. One is to look at uh, <coughs> uh, digital identity sharing for financial institutions in Japan. So uh, you can have many different institutions that, uh, that each institution verifies the identity of the same people. Uh, they don't share any data or information. They all just do the same work independently. Uh, but if you can uh, create a platform where these different institutions can share the identity of the same people, maybe uh, one bank will identify someone's information, but then uh, later share that with other banks. So that way, uh, you know, it's more efficient. And the, the reason you, you would share in that case is you have some kind of financial incentive. So uh, you can, you can sell, sell this uh, verification information in exchange for, um, you know, some money. So it's kind of a platform for uh, selling and buying of uh, the ver verified information. So, but there's a key point, and that's you don't actually sell the, or you don't actually share inf the personally identifiable information of people between the institutions. What you do is you, you take a hash of the information, and then you digitally sign that hash. And uh, I think everyone here knows how hashing works, or at least the, the concept. It's a one-way function, so uh, you put in some data as an input, and you have a unique, unique random number as an output uh, for that uh, inputted data. So then you take that uh, uh, random number string, and then you sign it with your, with your private key, and uh, you create a digital signature. And so the digital signature could be from, like, a, I don't know, Citibank or, or someplace like that. And, uh, what you can do is then you can, the person can share this information with a new bank. So I could, I could go to, uh, I don't know, this is New York, why not? Go to Goldman Sachs or something and open an account. Uh, I give them my information and then Citibank gives them uh, the digital certificate that they signed uh, with the hash of my information. And then they, they hash my information at Goldman Sachs and they check that the digital signature is a match. So they see that Citibank already uh, looked at my address, uh, verified I'm not on any uh, watch list, and open an account for me. So it's, uh, it's kind of a way to, uh, to outsource the verification of people's personal information to other institutions. So this is, uh, this is actually made for the Japanese regulatory environment, but this is something we're working towards. So this service hasn't actually launched, but we created just a prototype and we're talking to different institutions in Japan uh, working with them on this. So it's, it's just a very simple uh, app. Uh, and there's many things about identity, but um, you can expand it to uh, institutional identity and things like that. Um, one other thing that's interesting is once you have identity managed, you can then uh, do asset management on top of the identity. So one uh, use case that we explored was with an event currency uh, in Fukushima. So this is called uh, Moika. It's a one-day event currency at an anime event. And uh, most... Uh, I don't know, currencies, digital currencies, you pay some money and then you get it uh, in exchange for the money that you pay. But because this is a fun event, we want to promote communications. So what we did was uh, you take your phone and you shake it and then it creates a QR code. And then within five seconds, if someone else uh, would scan the QR code, uh, then new units of this currency is, are created and they're given to both of you. This is how it works. So you create a QR code and then someone scans it. If they scan it, then uh, uh, you get uh, new units of the currency. So um, th there's actually a video of this in action. Uh, so this was filmed by NHK, uh, National News uh, Broadcaster in Japan. But um, yeah, you can see people are uh, scanning each other's phones and then creating this new unit of the currency. It's kind of like Bitcoin mining, but instead of a computational puzzle, it's through communication. And uh, then you know, th these are just points created out of nothing, so they don't have any value. But uh, to kind of bootstrap the value process, what we did was we, um, this is a one-day event, so we, what we did was we bought some uh, uh, coffee and popcorn and cocoa, and uh, you could exchange it for this currency. And you could also take raffle tickets, and you could win, uh, like this guy's taking a raffle ticket, and then you could win various um, uh, anime goods or buttons uh, with this character, uh, Moika, on it. And uh, uh, you could send 
the currency to each other using QR codes. So this is the simple uh, payment system that we had. So um, anyway, this is, uh, this is kind of a fun event. Uh, about a quarter of the people who attended the event downloaded and installed the apps. So it was actually quite interesting. So we expanded, this is just a one day event. So we want to expand this uh, to something more meaningful. So what we did was uh, in March, we did a test at the University of Aizu on a campus currency for the campus. So called uh, Byakko, and uh, uh, so at the campus store, they have different uh, things, right, that people buy, and uh, what we did was we gave them this iPad, and uh, this is a register application. So you can scan, uh, uh, register QR code in order to send money, and uh, uh, this is, first you, what you do is you charge uh, the app with uh, Japanese yen, so it's kind of like a prepaid card is how it works. So, um, It'll show it in a second. So if you want to charge 3,000 yen, you give them 3,000 yen at the store, and then you have 3,000 digital uh, yen. It's well called byakko. And then you could use that at the uh, campus store, or you could use it at the cafeteria. And uh, it was just a very simple test that we did for um, a couple weeks in uh, March. And this will go, uh, we're expanding this to be available to all students at the university and uh, launch in, uh, in summer. Uh, so in a couple months, we'll launch. It, we've been working with this professor at the university on, on this, so um, it's kind of a fun, uh, kind of a fun project. Uh, just you know, until now they actually have a physical card at the university that's uh, magnetically red. Uh, the reason to use this currency there is because um, uh, you get a discount at the cafeteria if you use it. So uh, it's like a 50 yen discount or something, but um, you know, it's uh, it, it adds up, and students don't have much money, so. Uh, and I've bought this card before, but then I left it at home in Tokyo when I go up to Fukushima. This, this university is in Fukushima Prefecture. And uh, so it, it's much nicer to have a, a mobile phone because then you, you know, you always have your phone with you. So that's, uh, that's, that's uh, Byakko, this uh, very simple uh, uh, campus currency. And we're hoping to kind of expand this to be a more general platform that you can then uh, use it in a university in Japan. So that's uh, one of the things we're working on. Um, another thing that you can do once you have a digital identity that's on your mobile device is uh, you, you can uh, manage different things like contracts. So for example, uh, weather derivative contracts. So we're working with the uh, Sompo Holdings. They're uh, one of the, uh, well, the third largest uh, disaster, uh, I don't know, uh, insurance company in Japan. So they handle things like, um, uh, you know, earthquake disasters or car accidents, things like that. So let's say um, they also s do things like to hedge risks, they sell uh, financial derivatives. So you can buy a derivative saying that uh, next week on Monday it's going to rain or not. And uh, if it's going to rain, I get some money because maybe I have a big event and it gets canceled. So. Um, what we do is uh, it w works like a smart contract. Uh, our system gets uh, weather data from the National Weather Service. It gets uh, written onto the Iderha blockchain. And then uh, there's a contract that runs, uh, you know, once a day saying that, uh, you know, if the weather data, if it rained or not, if, if the conditions match the conditions of the contract, then uh, the person gets paid some money. So we, d we do automatic payout. So. This is a good use case for kind of automating the workflow of uh, things like, uh, I don't know, rule-based uh, contracts. And um, it's, it's really quite simple. Until now, a lot of this is done by hand. So it's, it's good to kind of uh, create an IT layer that handles this. So that's, that's one of the uh, platforms we're working on. And uh, this, this is kind of an interesting example. So uh, uh, I went to a hackathon last year in, uh, in Russia and uh, we thought, you know, we're in Russia, so let's create digital vodka. Let's, uh, uh, so what we did was uh, we, we created a digital vodka rights. So it's kind of a crowdfunding application. So crowdfunding currently, the way it, well, uh, I don't know, fundraising right now, the way it works right now is uh, a brewery would go to a financier, like a bank or somewhere, and get some kind of loan or line of credit that they then can use to buy potatoes and then brew their vodka and then sell to uh, consumers. Um, but just looking at the image graphically, there's not really a good, uh, you know, ecosystem. It's not really a loop. It's, it's kind of, uh, you know, you, you move here and then there's someone up here that uh, 
is kind of, you know, not really part, but just taking some money. <laughs> um, so uh, what we we're proposing is that uh, you create a, a digital vodka. So rights to drink uh, or receive vodka that you give to the farmers in order for the potatoes, uh, to get the potatoes, and then you can, uh, farmers can then sell these rights to the consumers. And then the consumers could even have, you know, a, a speculative market on the, uh, these vodka rights. So like uh, if this year the vodka is going to be really good, then maybe uh, it has a higher price than other years or something. So, um, and then these rights can then be used to receive the vodka or they can be used in payment. Uh, I didn't really write it, but you could also, for example, use this in stores for barter. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you want to buy a beer, maybe you don't give five dollars; you give uh, 50 milliliters of vodka uh, rights to the to the store or something. So, um, and it's good for tipping, maybe too. You can give, uh, you know, instead of giving a dollar or something, here's five milliliters of vodka. But <laughs> um, this is just a, an example. And this so this is all done on the blockchain. Uh, be just the reason being, it's very easy to manage these assets. And if you do it in a public way, uh, you know, anyone can access this data and they can freely, you know, do commerce using these rights. So we created just a simple Android app, uh, which ran uh, on top of Idraha. And uh, you can see you know, there's vodka rights and bread rights. Uh, so you could uh, then send this to people um, using just QR codes and... Uh, uh, there's a little bit of gamification as well, like with, with badges. Like if you send, send a bunch of vodka, you get some kind of, um, you know, credit or, or badge. But uh, anyways, this is a very simple uh, proof of concept that we built. Just a hackathon, but actually it's a very serious uh, task. Like you could expand this to uh, things like crowdfunding uh, a new movie theater by selling the seats ahead of time or uh, buying an airplane uh, and selling the right to write on it. So it's, uh, it's kind of an interesting, uh, I don't know, uh, idea. And then, uh, yeah, we're doing other work as well. So uh, we're also building a, a payment infrastructure for the Kingdom of Cambodia, uh, working with the National Bank. So uh, this is a just a settlement infrastructure that uh, is actually using blockchain technology. I think this is the first case uh, in the world of a central bank using block private uh, blockchain technology uh, for a, a real use case. So this is quite a fun project. We just started last month, and uh, one of the interesting things is that the National Bank is actually working with us to develop uh, Iderha as well. So uh, they're contributing to the open source project, and uh, it's, it's quite a fun project to work on. Um, there's a... Uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of future work. I don't know how much I should go into this, but um, uh, if you're really familiar with uh, distributed ledger technology, maybe you can understand some of these arguments. So uh, if you have central bank digital currency and uh, you know securities, you can do things like EVP, uh, so, so uh, delivery of uh, you know some kind of shares in for payment. And you can do settlement finality in a very quick and easy way. And uh, the advantage of using distributed ledger technology for this is you get transparency. You can look at all the transactions and you can see who did what, uh, who owns what. So you can do things like stop insider trading or um, stop illegal money laundering, things like that. Um, and you also get high security because records uh, are tamper evident. If you try to change any of the data in a distributed ledger, you can see that the data have been changed. There's some disadvantages though. And that's uh, privacy. So all the transactions are, of course, visible. So you can see who has what. Uh, even if you don't know who it is, you see this, this address has uh, these assets. And you can probabilistically uh, do some uh, analysis saying that, uh, you know, with some likelihood, this address is this person just because of the, the network uh, of who they transact with. And maybe things like time or things like that. So. Uh, it's really a big disadvantage. So to kind of solve these problems is an area of uh, current research, uh, not just for us in Idraha, but uh, for other, uh, I don't know, projects as well, and for the, the whole uh, industry as a whole. So we're looking at things like anonymous transactions, like not just through probabilistic mis mixing or any uh, obfuscation like that, but using real security like homomorphic encryption uh, or things like oblivious transfer in order to, uh, you know, hide who's sending what, or even hide what they're sending. 
uh, we're also looking at just pure uh, segregation of the data. So if, uh, if you're not a party to a transaction, maybe you shouldn't even have the data itself. So that's the philosophy used by, uh, mainly by R3 right now, so like uh, in Corda. And also uh, IBM's Fabric is moving in that direction as well. So uh, it's really hard to know what the best use case is. The advantage of uh, blockchain technology is transparency. So it seems weird that you would try to uh, create an uh, obfuscated layer on top, but it, it seems that that's what's really needed uh, for a lot of financial, uh, I don't know, use cases. So um, anyway, so that's uh, just the basic uh, thing I wanted to say, and I've talked for at least the time allotted to me. So um, maybe if we have some time, I can take some questions. Okay, so the, uh, the comment, I guess, was that uh, in the U.S. there's already some uh, framework for people like ride-sharing a plane. Right, right, yeah, exactly. And uh, what's it called? It's called NetJets. NetJets. Okay, I never heard of it before. Um, yeah. Okay, so it's, yeah, it's kind of like a mm, time-sharing type of thing. Okay, no, that's great. Sounds great, actually. I hate uh, flying so uh, on public uh <laughs> jets, so it sounds great. Net jets, okay. Yeah, this this is a really great. Uh, so okay, so any kind of sharing economy application is really great for uh, use case for blockchain. I think. Um, uh, I think actually Airbnb recently bought. Uh, well, it wasn't recent. It's was quite a while ago. They bought a blockchain company. Um, <coughs> so it's uh, it makes sense that you would want to do some c things with like a decentralized uh, uh, reputation system, like. You know, you want to share uh, a jet with someone or timeshare a place with someone. How's their reputation? Are they going to leave this jet, you know, in shambles? Or <laughs> um, so it's uh, it's important to kind of track that in a in a way that uh, everyone can see and have transparency about and feel good about. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, yeah, so the uh, the DIF was uh, announced on Monday at uh, Consensus, and uh, unfortunately I was busy with another talk, so I couldn't see it. Um, I gave three panel discussions there. But uh, yeah, uh, we're really interested in DIF, and we're talking with uh, Microsoft about it, so uh, maybe we'll join. Uh, we haven't joined yet, but we're looking at it. Okay. Any message to it, though? Uh, uh, well, the whole thing about identity is t for it to have any meaning, you have to have a standard. And uh, if everyone does their own thing, I, I don't really see, I see it very hard to get traction. Uh, that being said, there's no real compelling standard right now. And uh, it does take a lot of resources to join an organization like that and then argue your point and um, you know, be active. So it's, it's plus and minus, but um, overall we're very positive on it. You can ask technical questions too, uh, doesn't matter. Okay, so um well uh okay, so that's that's an interesting question. Um so about a year ago we were looking at different platforms at the time, including Ethereum as well. Uh, but uh, I don't know, they, d they didn't really meet our needs for mobile applications. Uh, okay, so uh, one is transaction finality that is really fast. So uh, Ethereum uses Nakamoto consensus, at least, okay, so there's Eris and there's other things now, but um, at least a year ago it was, it was not as uh, 
coalesced as it is now. Uh, so using things like any kind of mining-based uh, blockchain isn't really good for transaction finality because, uh, you know, two people can generate blocks at about the same time or at the same time, and uh, then you get uncled blocks. So you get blocks that, uh, you know, your transaction can could disappear after it becomes, uh, you know, final. So that's, that's really not... It's very unlikely, but it's very bad for any kind of financial use case. Um, another is uh, the, the whole architecture should be really low latency and high performance. So, um, uh, you know, looking at things like Fabric I a year ago is, is very, uh, it wasn't really meeting the performance needs that we had. And, uh, and Bitcoin, of course, is uh, extremely slow. So um, what we did was we said, you know, let's write our own architecture in C++ and just make things really uh, as highly optimized as possible to handle things like uh, 1,000 transactions per second and then finality within you know, a second or something. So uh, that's what we're working on. So anyway, so it's mainly just none of the platforms out there really met the performance criteria that we had uh, when we started out. So, and we had a good team and we said, uh, you know, we have enough uh, developing resources, developer resources where we can, you know, make our own system. So. <laughs> okay, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, we don't uh, really publicly talk about our team size. And uh, th well, the reason is because it's a very competitive environment. In Japan, it's like uh, uh, the Warring States period. Uh, you know, everyone is uh, out to eat each other's pie. But, um, uh, but we, we do have a good team that uh, is sufficiently capable of doing uh, at least parallel projects. And um, uh, how do we get projects? How do we do our uh, you know marketing or whatever? So we, we just talk to a lot of companies. We, we try to focus not on uh, the technology really, but the needs that people have. So, um, and also potential. So we can say, um, like for example, uh, we go to a company and say, You've got a lot of users, but you're not really monetizing your user base. Um, you've got like millions of users, but uh, you know maybe all you're doing is giving them advertising or something. You know you can expand that. You can you could do something like build a uh, an app bank based on blockchain technology, really cheap. And you can uh, you know banks have a hard time finding users, and you've got users already. So let's do this. So anyway, so that's the type of uh, thing that we talk about. And then we also look at needs like. Um, for example, the derivative contract work. Maybe you're doing a lot of stuff by hand. You know, we can automate this for you, and you can save you uh, a very, you know, uh, easy to understand amount of money. So that's the type of thing. And uh, we don't we don't do too many projects in parallel. We uh, we we don't really do more than two or three projects at a time in parallel. We just work really focused and really fast. And if we can, we uh, we try to. Uh, keep the same people working on only one thing at once. Otherwise, there's a huge context uh, switching cost. Uh, this question again, not necessarily the company, but like, as a Samsung, you have similar similar use case. Like, the show was that they'll be uh, selling their Samsung phones and they'll be selling their Samsung phones. Like, if you can switch it over, really. I mean, that's kind of uh, Yeah, but uh, so Samsung's really okay. So the question is, uh, you know. S s Big big players like Samsung are coming in, so uh, you know can't Samsung just take over the whole market? And how can we compete? Um, well, I mean IBM is in the market now, and they created uh, you know Fabric and Intel created Sawtooth, and we're in some ways we're competing with them uh, in that, and uh, uh, in some ways indirectly, in some ways directly. Um, I mean, it's everyone uh, wants to eat eat every everything, eat all the pie, but. Uh, the thing is, the pie is really big, actually, and uh, so we're no one's gonna have everything. It's a very competitive environment. It, a lot of it's based on trust. Uh, uh, you know, uh, what kind of connections do you have? Who do you, who can you trust? So, I think we're we're gonna be okay going into the future. So, any anything else, Nathan? Ran away. Um, but I guess, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, sure.
Uh, yeah, maybe. So the, the comment, uh, just to repeat to see if I'm correct, was um, uh, so Japan has a much higher adoption, much fast, faster adoption curve, at least res with respect to blockchain technology, than Europe or America. So, uh, you know, how can we survive in yeah. e Europe and America? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, I think uh, a lot of it comes down to needs, and uh, to be honest, in in a lot of places, including Japan, uh, America, and Europe, there's not really a lot of needs. Uh, people have great infrastructure already, so that's why uh, places like Cambodia uh, have been some of the fastest for like real payment systems. Um, in Japan, uh, there are some needs that institutions have just because of uh, kind of maybe poor IT decisions and management, uh, you know, built up over a few decades. Uh, in the U.S., I'm not totally familiar with the market. Uh, there are needs here. Uh, a VP from J.P. Morgan told me that uh, they're not even sure what kind of assets they, they have because of uh, decades of, uh, like, errors inputting, uh, you know, numbers from various contracts, so, so um, and it, it's really, uh, there, there are some needs, but uh, in the U.S. and uh, Europe and, and Japan, I think there are more institutional needs, and uh, whereas in uh, developing countries, the governments have needs for that. Um, there's also one other comment that uh, in Japan, a lot of financial institutions don't really have strong IT departments. Uh, if you come to New York, you know, Citibank or whatever has even Goldman Sachs, you know, they can program anything they want. They don't need us, uh, which is, um, I think, in some ways, uh, slowing things down in, in the U.S. and Europe because uh, the institutions, they kind of think or they know that they can do things themselves, but they're really huge and slow giants uh, or dinosaurs, and uh, they don't really move uh, very slowly. So uh, a company like us can move a lot faster. In Japan, they need us. Uh, they need a fast company that can actually run fast and, and build things. And, and they know it. Uh, I want to thank you for coming. I thought the session was great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, are there any other, if there are any other questions, we're, we're just going to kind of organically move into uh, another Q&A. And then um, we'll have the third company, Bancor, uh, do a short presentation. So stick around. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> That's a great introduction. Thank you. I don't. I don't know where to go from there. Um, so first of all, thanks to everyone for coming out. Um, and I, I understand that Ed gave a presentation. I'm sorry, I got stuck. It was awesome. And I, I understand Ed gave an awesome presentation. <laughs> and that maybe there's some peop people who who had some additional questions or some more detailed questions. And so I'm I'm more than happy to field those questions. I I can tell you a little bit about um, the the background, sort of what got us here and and how we're going through the implementation and stuff like that. Uh, but r really, uh, you know, feel, f feel free to lead with, with whatever you feel is, you know, uh, burning questions for you. <laughs> I recognize you, yeah, yeah, so thanks for coming out. Yeah, so, um, so you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny thing um, I really didn't want to build a blockchain. I was trying. I have been working on building 
a decentralized social network for a long time now, um, and largely because I think there are there's some issues around having our private data <laughs> belonging to someone else and, and having someone else control the lar lion's share of identity solutions and things like that. So, um, and, and so, as you know, I was working with Scenario on this. Uh, we, we, we partnered up. Um, and I had really hoped to be able to use either Bitcoin or, or something like Ethereum. And I just realized that they weren't going to scale. Um, and then as I started looking at some of the other projects in the space, I realized that they were making progress because they decided to own the blockchain technology. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Is it <laughs> Bless you, my friend. Um, uh, okay, so um, anyway, the, uh, uh, the, the, um, there, there were a lot of really basic things that I knew from concurrency theory, which is where I've done the bulk of my mathematical uh, research uh, for quite some time, that I knew weren't being addressed. Um, uh, and and al already in DevCon 1, it was very clear that, that Ethereum was, gon was going to be going that way. Um, No, no, it's it's not going to be there. It's not going to be there for for quite some time. And I, I, I honestly, if you talk to people like Vlad and Vitalik, I think they're quite open about it, right? There's there's a lot of work yet to be done. And the Ethereum architecture, as it stands, like again, I am not denigrating the Ethereum architecture. You know, I'm so happy that people have have the guts, the guts and the imagination to go forward uh, I into the unknown, right? And a lot of these people, they, they didn't grow up, you know on concurrency theory. <laughs> I mean, l literally back in the 80s, when I was delivering papers at Uppsala, you know, that's when I, I bumped into uh, a Samson Abramsky and people like that, and I and really got into concurrency theory quite deeply, and that, that's sort of what I grew up on. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, so, so there's, a, there's a lot to, to learn, a lot to absorb that from c the computer science of the last 30 or 40 years that just hasn't hit mainstream. Right, and, and, but once you know that, once you understand that, hey, uh, well, first of all, it should just be dirt obvious that um, you're not going to get a scalable platform by trying to have a global sequential order on the global transactions. <laughs> it just isn't gonna happen, right? The, the reason things work at scale today is because when you buy your coffee at Starbucks on the corner, that transaction is completely independent from someone buying eggs in Shanghai, right? They, they proceed independently, and and because because of that, you know, you get a scalable system. But hey, we, we, we knew that, right? It wasn't w this was this is not rocket science. You, all you have to do is go, huh? Well, the sun is falling on me, and and the light that's falling on me is not serialized with the light that's falling on you. <laughs> they run independently. That's what. That's when you need to know what 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 order what exactly. Th so and 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 sort of figuring that out and having enough of the infrastructure at the blockchain level to be able to figure that out. I mean, essentially, blocks represent a synchronization boundary. That's really what they are. But but that's a very arbitrary boundary. And and, and there's no there's uh, reasoning about block size as a way of doing synchronization is a very silly idea, right? What you really need is more detailed information at the level of the transactions through the contracts to get, uh, to get what are legal serialization orders, right? And that, that will help you scale. And there's, a, there's a lot more to it, but that gives you the rough idea. Um, so, so that's one of the things that's at the heart of uh, the, the, the R-Chain solution. The other thing um, is, and, and I, we've, all, we've all already had this experience, code that runs really fast but is broken is still broken really fast. Right, and and if it's broken in a way that there's a security loophole and you can drain money out, it runs really fast and you can drain money out really fast, <laughs> right? So so scaling is not just about throughput or storage volume sizes uh, or, or or compute cycles. Scaling in reality is also about correctness. So the other thing that makes our chain tick 
is the relationship between the model of computation that we choose, which is fundamentally concurrent, and how that's realized in all the pieces. So we begin from a core model of computation that through careful analysis can be shown to fit all the features of the domain. All right, so that, that model is built on, on a calculus called the row calculus, which derives from Robin Milner's pi calculus for which he won the Turing Award. Okay, and this just basically improves upon the pi calculus in, in certain fundamental ways. Right, so, and that, that, so that model is, is already sound and then, and then s we, ha we do, we do wha what's called the correct by construction approach. So we derive the virtual machine from that model. So when you get to the virtual machine, you already know that it's sound. It's already correct, right? So at the infrastructure level, we have proofs of correctness. And that's what you need. Let me th think about it, right? You're going to walk up to, to the, uh, the, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the higher ups in Goldman Sachs, and you say, you know what we'd like to do is we'd like to replace all of your infrastructure with this brand new, untested technology. What do you think? <laughs> we just want you to run a, you know, billions of dollars worth of transactions through this, you know, and it's never been tested before. Sounds like a good idea, right? Um, so, so, so really what they need in order to feel a little less anxious is, is some kind of assurances. And what kind of assurances do you want? Well, how about mathematical proof? In fact, how about mathematical proof that you can automate so that the proofs are actually checkable by machine, right? That would be kind of cool. And we do this in two different ways. So we're doing this at the level of the infrastructure technology itself, right? So we're proving out the, 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 the virtual machine, proving out the compiler. By the way, again, not knocking Ethereum. Ethereum is awesome. But but the, there's a very clear model of uh, computation uh, witnessed in the yellow paper, in the, the Ethereum Virtual Machine 1.0. Okay, it's a very specific model of computation. Now, the model of computation that's in Solidity is not the same as the, the EVM. So, so you have a proof obligation when you produce a compiler from Solidity to EVM bytecode. And if you don't discharge that proof obligation, then someone can come along and inject bytecodes into your, into your compilation, right? And it's halting hard to determine whether or not <laughs> the, the new bytecodes are, are what you intended, right? So you need to prove the correctness of your compiler. They haven't done that, and moreover, they're in a really sticky situation because no one has provided an independent operational semantics for Solidity itself. So there's no way to show that you have a correct compiler until you've provided a, an operational semantics for Solidity itself. There's, you, there's no standard to judge that the bytecodes do the right thing according to this other form of execution. It's good enough, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's good enough to write the DAO. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes, please. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, no, I, I think, I, so, so uh, that's one way to carve things, but that's not necessarily how you carve things out. So, so, so think about namespaces as, as, as literally just address spaces. I mean, the, 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 the simplest, the simplest th way to conceptualize namespaces are um, uh, patterns of URIs. So, so the, these URIs, and it might be an infinite number of them, all fit in this namespace. Right now, now, does do you want one token for that namespace? Well, you might have a very large namespace that includes multiple sub namespaces, right? So in that case, you don't want one token, right? So th so the token, I think of tokens as really about um, the 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 give and take within a particular community. So a particular community might carve out um, multiple namespaces that are appropriate for the work that they're doing, right? So for example. Um, my local farmer's market, right? So they, 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 there might be uh, namespaces that are associated with um, all, all the management of the stalls. There might be namespaces that are associated with uh, the, the kinds of vendors that are allowed to, that are allowed to, to trade there, right? Um, and, and you might have different kinds of access mechanisms there, right? So there might be a token for, for the stall, or maybe not. There might be a token for each individual vendor, 
right? So the, the cheese makers all have one token, the cheese token, right? Uh, but uh, hopefully that gives you an idea. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but there are there are there are multiple different kinds of techniques. So so the technique that you're talking about is largely what's called theorem proving, right. right? So and there are multiple different kinds of approaches to theorem proving. So today there are uh, some relatively robust and relatively mature theorem provers like Isabel and Hall, or um, uh, uh, Koch is another one. And if they actually use their fundamental they 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 have a. That's right. Yeah, yeah, but but in general, a lot of that kind of work is actually um, it needs to be directed by humans still. Right, yeah. yeah, right. So 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 it won't it won't just be uh, completely automated by machines, but there'll be proof tactics right. that humans provide as as a way of helping the machine figure out the proof. And but yes. Sort of That's exactly right. That's but there's another there's another technique that's that I didn't get a chance to talk about the the the, the second layer of, of formal correctness, which we inject directly into the methodology of developing smart contracts. So so w we provide proof of correctness of the fundamental infrastructure, but then on top of that, people write contracts like the like the Dow contract or other kinds of contracts, right? And what you like is some kind of assurance that those contracts do what they say they do. So, so uh, w probably most people in this room are familiar with the idea of programs and types. So a Java program has, you know, has a type associated with it, uh, like a, a method will have a type associated with it. A class is the type of an instance of that class, right? So those, those are kind of, and the, co the Java compiler provides a check that the program code matches the type specifications. Now that turns out to be a poor man's theorem prover. And so, so what we have is a very, very rich type system, which allows you to express some, some very detailed things. Like, for example, is there a race in this contract? So you, you can write that down as a type level specification in the Roland contracting language. And, and it, so you, you can demand, for example, that um, the, uh, the updating of state must be sequentially before receiving or, or, uh, or processing a new request. Now, the DAO bug itself was exactly a race along these lines. It was processing new requests unfairly in front of updating the state, okay? So our type checker would have caught, we, we wrote a little paper about this last year about this time, our type checker would have caught that bug. So you never, it never would have compiled. And so, so this way we're, we're taking what, every programmer and their sister does, which is to, ch well, ex except JavaScript programmers, <laughs> um, which is to, you know, type check their programs. Um, and, and, and so, so s and, and since that's already a part of the culture, it's the way they do things, we feel that that's the most natural place to inject these kinds of formal methods to prove the correctness and catch the deployment uh, of these kinds of errors before they go out. In, in, the case of, in, the, in the case of the DAO bug, in, in, in the Rolang development community, you wouldn't even get to check in your code, let alone deploy it. Why? Because it doesn't compile. Nobody checks in code that doesn't even compile, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> It's cool, yeah, exactly.
<laughs> well, that, so the, the, uh, I think the important the important thing here is. I don't know. I don't know that story. One second here. The code, the code passed those audits. Now, wh whether or not, uh, whether or not uh, Vitalik was an auditor that gave it the thumbs up, I know there were auditors that gave it the thumbs up, and I was involved. I was involved with uh, uh, with Vlad and uh, uh, Gun Emir uh, in the cleanup. Post post facto, after it was deployed, but no, anyway. Uh, okay. Well, then we have we have we have a different version of events. But anyway, it doesn't it doesn't matter because the point is that in a situation where you have types that could catch the bug, it doesn't have to be audited like this. We don't have to have a lot of social process around this. That's what we're trying to get to is a development methodology that injects automated theorem proving at the point of type checking the contracts. Right, so that's that's a much much better approach. I'm not saying it's the the, the 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 a panacea. There will be lots of things that can that can sneak through the type systems, and on top of that, the type systems will will be too draconian occasionally. So it will say, don't deploy this when the programmer knows better. Right, so it's it's not a panacea, but it's a hell of a lot better than than the way we do things right now. So 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 those are those are the two different kinds of formal methods. So we have we have a we have a. a um, uh, uh, a very, very promising start on performance. So the storage layer alone is getting about 80,000 transactions per second. When you add networking and the consensus algorithm on top of that, that will drop to about half. But you can check our numbers right now. We've published them. Code is up there. You can check the storage layer right now to see, to see that that's the case. Um, and uh, and, s and when, you, when you add in the networking overhead, it's going to drop. And then when you add in the consensus overhead, it's going to drop. But at about 40,000 transactions, we're competitive with Visa. Yeah, so go ahead. Well, they've got the blockchain, which is a kind of storage layer. Yeah, I mean, it's not a content delivery mechanism, and that's for sure. Thank you so much, and if you want to talk to me, you know, feel free to come, come and grab me. Okay, so uh, I think we'll s we'll start. All right, so hello to everyone. Thanks for staying a little later. Yeah, yeah, you can hear me. Okay, so I'm going to uh, yeah. So I'm I'm going to share with you a little bit about Bancor, and I hope everybody can hear me. Um, and so the idea behind Bancor is uh, we are focused on what we call the long tail of user-generated currencies. And if you haven't heard the term long tail before, long tail basically refers to what happens when you take something that had a very high cost of failure and you make it a very low cost of failure. Right? So as an example, YouTube. Right? YouTube made it very inexpensive for everybody to broadcast video. Before YouTube, if you wanted to broadcast video to millions of people, you needed to own a TV station or convince somebody to broadcast your video. 
but the moment anybody could do it, you had what it was called a long tail, meaning you had millions and millions of people trying uh, to upload content. And something very interesting about the long tail is that a long tail ends up being two to three orders of magnitude bigger than the hits. So, you know, if you take, for example, the top thousand most popular videos on YouTube, right? Videos that have a billion views each. So you're, you're Justin Bieber's, you're Katy Perry's, and you add them all up together, it won't even be 0.1% of the traffic on YouTube. 99% of the traffic is in the long tail. And if we look at other industries where we've seen a long tail emerge, whether this is Reddit or Facebook groups, whenever there's a long tail, it tends to basically replace whatever came before it. So, you know, Wikipedia replaced Encyclopedia Britannica. Blogs today are one of the main sources of news and content today on the internet. Um, so, when we got into cryptocurrency in 2011, we got very excited about user-generated currency, and we realized there's going to be a long tail. Uh, but there's, there's a little bit of a challenge in creating a long tail in user-generated currencies. For one, you have to make it very simple for anybody to create a currency. Uh, so one of the things we did is we actually created a very, very simple interface where you can use a chatbot, whether you're using Facebook Messenger or Telegram or WeChat or Line in Japan or even soon Status IM, and you can talk with the chatbot, or you type with the chatbot, and uh, you can say, I want to create a currency, and you know, this is uh, the different parameters of the currency, and by the time you finish answering the questions, you have an actual currency, in this case on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, and likewise, if you want to initiate a token sale or a crowd sale or what some people call an ICO, you answer uh, another set of questions. You say, you know, there's going to be a minimum, there's going to be a maximum, this is how it's going to work. And at the end, boom, you have a crowd sale, right? So this is something that somebody can do without any technical knowledge. You don't need a development team. You don't need to know how to write solidity code. And yet it democratizes token creation. And uh, we, we imagine a future where you will see millions and millions, not hundreds like you have today, but millions of user-generated cryptocurrencies. Now, there's, there's one more challenge if you really want to create a long tail of currencies, and that's that you have a liquidity barrier, right? So there's this very interesting notion that a lot of people haven't heard about, but it's, it's very intuitive once you understand it, and it's called the double coincidence of wants problem. Right? And if you think about barter, anytime you, you try to barter with somebody, you have a double coincidence of wants. You need two people to meet with opposite wants in real time. Right? So I'm gonna come with my uh, tomatoes and you're gonna come with your carrots and we need to want exactly opposite things and that's a very rare coincidence of wants. Right? So what do we do to solve this problem in barter? We invented money. And money solves the double coincidence of wants and barter because it separates the buying from the selling. I can come, I can buy now, you can come and sell later. Uh, many domains have a double coincidence of wants. In fact, before the invention of writing, we had a double coincidence of wants in human communication. We had to meet in real time. One person had to want to say something, another person had to want to hear something, and then they could exchange information. But after the invention of writing, now you know, I can read something that Socrates wrote thousands of years ago. The challenge is that amongst currencies, we still have a double coincidence of wants because there's no money for money, right? So anytime you exchange your euros for your dollars, your bitcoins for your ether, wh whatever, your, your Apple shares for dollars, you have a double coincidence of wants. You need somebody on the other side that wants the opposite of what you want, right? So this creates actually a very big barrier to liquidity. You need to have market makers who provide liquidity, you have a nice bid and ask, right? And where they meet in the middle, that's the market price, and that's how all currencies have been exchanged for hundreds of years. But if you want to have a long tail of user-generated currency, that's not gonna work, because you'll never have all the lines connecting all the currencies. You're not gonna have market makers providing liquidity for every little tiny currency. Uh, so this, this was kind of the main challenge that we had to solve, and we solve this by creating what we call smart tokens. And what's special about smart tokens is that they are actually their own market makers. So they can do their own price discovery. They can achieve their own liquidity. They don't need another person on the other side. They don't need an order book to match bids and asks. 
They have actually all kinds of other intrinsic features in them that are unrelated to liquidity, and you know we can talk about them maybe later. Uh, things like delegated account recovery and a built-in vault and all kinds of cool stuff. But I think the, the main thing is that unlike a regular token, a smart token holds a reserve of another token. But the main difference here between a reserve and the kind of the classical way you'd think of a reserve is that a smart token holds a reserve in a, in a format we call CRR, constant reserve ratio. Right, so if I have a token and it has a reserve, let's say, just to make it simple, let's say it has a reserve of Ether, and it has a 10% reserve. Right, the reserve will always be 10%. The reserve can never not be 10% of the market cap. It doesn't matter how much you add to it. It doesn't matter how much you pull out of it. It will always be 10%. Now, how does this work? And right, so a smart token, unlike a normal ERC-20 token, there's actually a new standard. It's called ERC-228. And a smart token basically can be purchased for any token that it holds in reserve, and it can be liquidated for any token that it holds for, for any token that it holds in the reserve. So if I want to buy this smart token, I'll send in this example Ether, I'll send Ether to the smart contract. It will issue me the token. Right? So a smart token doesn't have a fixed supply, its supply can go up and down. So I'll send Ether to the reserve, it'll issue me the smart token. And when I want to pull Ether out of the reserve, I'll simply send the smart token to the smart contract. It will liquidate, destroy the smart token, and it'll pull Ether out of the reserve for me. So I don't need to trade the smart token with another person. I don't need to be match made in an exchange, in an order book. I can just buy and sell my token vis-a-vis -vis the smart contract. Now there's, you know, if you understand math very well, then here are the formulas on how it works. But to make it simple, um, every time you buy a smart token and you add money to the reserve, the price of the token goes up. And every time you sell a smart token and pull money out of the reserve, the price of the token goes down. And what these formulas basically say is that whenever you do this, we break up your transaction into kind of infinitely small pieces, right? As if you had done infinite number of small transactions and the price was constantly changing every time you sent one of these infinitely small pieces and ultimately you can very easily determine what what will be the price of the token how much you will get for liquidating it or how much it will cost to buy it so ag again when you're when you're buying or selling a trans uh, a smart token you're doing the full transaction yourself there is no counterparty you're buying it all the way. You're selling it all the way vis-a-vis -vis the smart contract. Now, one of the cool things we discovered, this was actually a, a little bit of an accident. We set out to come up with this very simple building block to enable the long tail of user-generated currencies. But what we found in the process is that you can use this very simple concept of a token holding another token in reserve, money holding money, uh, which is what, of course, smart contracts enable. It was just never possible before this. You never had a situation where you had immutable, decentralized code that could hold programmable money. Uh, and what we found in the process is that instead of holding one token in reserve, you could hold multiple tokens in reserve. And instead of having a fractional reserve ratio, in other words, creating new credit, the way every single new altcoin creates, in their case, 100% new credit, if you actually had a reserve that added up to 100%, you wouldn't be creating new credit. Instead, you could create, for example, an ETF. So you can actually create smart tokens that are essentially decentralized index funds, except unlike other index funds, this is the first time you can hold an index fund yourself. You don't need a third party to hold your index fund. Right? So I can make a smart token, which is actually, let's say, the top 10 altcoins. On e uh, since it's e only on Ethereum today, so let's just, to be specific, the top 10 ERC-20 tokens, right? Or I could make a smart token that's like all the um, uh, infrastructure-based tokens or all the tokens that are doing prediction markets, right? I have a smart token that's Golem and Augur and, uh, sorry, Gnosis and Augur and whatever else will come in the future. So that's, that's what we do in a nutshell. I actually, before I, I turn it over to questions, because I'm sure there, there are probably a few, I want to show you our platform actually running live. And so I'll maybe ask Eyal to come and help me so I can talk while he, he shows it off. Uh, so this is actually uh, on testnet. Uh, we just kind of, to pilot it, we, we create thousands and thousands of currencies, and we, uh, 
we kind of stress test the system. So this is all fake data, so don't pay attention too much to the, to the words. Um, but to give an example, we'll, we'll just create a token right now in real time, so you see how easy it is. We're creating a, a smart token in this case. So we all just hit create a token. It brings up the bot. Uh, it supports all the main uh, instant messengers, so you don't have to actually install anything new on your phone. Everybody has an instant messenger on their phone. Uh, so in this case, we have Telegram, and it's going to ask us here. You can't see it very well, but it says, what is the name of your community, or what is the name of your token? And uh, let's just put uh, maybe Pencilworks, where we're, where we're being hosted. All right, and then it'll ask you for a little bit more information, so we'll just we'll race through this pretty quick. Uh, enter some kind of description, and then you can enter the location. It's integrated with Google, uh, with Google Maps, so we'll put in Brooklyn, and it knows, okay, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, let's put a symbol for our token, six letters. Let's call it, let's put pencil. All right. Um, and then what is the name for the single unit? Pencil, what is the name for the plural? This is mostly a user experience feature. Uh, and now we need to sign the transaction. We can't sign it safely inside Messenger, so it's going to take us back to the web. In the case of Status IM or other Ethereum-based messengers, you can actually sign it all the way straight from the messenger. And then here we'll just uh, put in Eyal's very secret private key. And that's it. We just created a token. Right, so the idea is that it, this, this is really something very, very simple that anybody can do. And now we have a whole little community here. We can start you know, beautifying it if we want a little bit, add a cover photo, uh, add some kind of avatar. We already have our little map over there. Uh, we actually give the users here, think of it maybe like Facebook for currencies, right? So we give them a full HTML5 editor. They can start creating their own page. They can actually inject their own source code. But maybe the coolest thing here is if we just go to the token tab, you see this is kind of the interface that the admin would see. You see that, okay, we created the token. It's a private token right now. The market cap, there's zero tokens in the supply. The market cap is zero. But now we can do all kinds of stuff with this token. For example, we could initiate a crowd sale. If we do that, the bot's going to come up again. It's going to ask us a series of different questions. At the end, we have an actual ICO that's running. Uh, or we can do what we call the advanced setup. Here we can actually create an ETF or a token changer, which is another thing we talk about in our white paper. Uh, so Eyal will just add a few maybe pretend currencies right now into the reserve. Uh, he will choose what their CRR is going to be, uh, somewhere between 1% and 100%. Uh, just pick, pick anything. And now we're starting to build the token. We don't actually have to do a crowd sale. We could just seed this token with a reserve if we already have currency and we just want to seed it. Uh, and when we hit go, this token becomes live and it becomes instantly tradable to Ether or to any one of its reserve currencies. Um, so, you know what, we'll, we'll, let's, let's stop with the demo right now and maybe we'll turn it over to questions. So first of all, it's a great question. Now uh, let's put a, let's put aside let's put aside the fact that uh, there's a different regulatory environment in every country, and everybody needs to be aware of whatever the regulations are in their country. Um, and so you certainly you. S The 
which is supporting this research and uh, they have built it in two years, two years, so uh, the two years are extremely because they haven't finished the proposal or also years of research institutions and they have to come back uh, with, with more. Or just, uh, you know, Monero, Alagon, go completely uh, So I so so look I, I I don't agree with you I don't agree with your statement I think that um, empowering people uh, to yeah empowering people to be able to create essentially credit creation I think it's a very very powerful concept you shouldn't create a security and market a security if it's illegal in your country there's the Howey test there's various different things to determine if something is a security. I'll give you an example of many things that are not securities. Loyalty points. Every small business or every even large businesses have loyalty points. When you fly with your airline miles, that's a loyalty point. You can use a token to create a loyalty point program. People could use this, for example, to create um, a loyalty point program for a group, of, for a farmer's market, uh, for their neighborhood, for a collection of small businesses. Large companies could use this for loyalty points. So it's just one use case. There are thousands, thousands of complementary currencies all over the world. Those are usually not based on blockchain. They're certainly not interchangeable with each other. They're certainly not connectable to the real world. Now, every single one of those communities can instantly upgrade their complementary currencies to a blockchain-based complementary currency. This is one example. Uh, the use of index funds, right? This is a different thing. If you have the right regulatory environment for your institution or to create an index fund. Here, now you can create an index fund. And not only can you create an index fund of altcoins, but as different institutions are beginning to tokenize assets such as oil, gold, fiat, and so on, you can use this to create an index fund of tokenized assets. Um, another great use case for smart tokens is you can create what we call a token changer. Right? So this is basically a decentralized exchange. Think of it like a decentralized shapeshift. So I can create right now a token changer that the two currencies it holds in reserve is Augur and Gnosis. All right, so I've now created a basically a little exchange where you can convert Augur to Gnosis with no counterparty. And any single person who wants to use that can convert their tokens, but any single person who wants to hold the smart token is actually providing liquidity to that exchange and now can participate in the fees that are gonna be there. So think about it like everybody can have a piece of Kraken right, or everybody can have a little piece of an exchange. Right? So that's another use for smart tokens. People are making protocol and project tokens all the time. Hopefully they're doing it in a legal way, whether it's a, a non-profit foundation or a for-profit foundation done in Switzerland or done in other territories where you have the right regulatory environment. And our argument is that using an ERC-228 standard is more efficient than making a standard simple ERC-20 token. By the way, ERC-228 tokens are ERC-20 compatible. So they can be held in any ERC-20 wallet. They can be sent to anybody using all those tools. So I would argue that today, even the protocol tokens that are coming into existence would benefit by having intrinsic liquidity and price discovery built in, not to mention a few other features that I just touched on very lightly. And you can read our white paper for more information, like delegated account recovery and integrated vault. So I think there are many, many uses for smart tokens, but certainly you should not create illegal securities and then market them to people. That, you know, we th that's, that's not why we created the platform and everybody is responsible. You know, you, you download Windows, you're gonna do illegal things with it, that's your problem. The, the fact that there's a platform there that lets anybody build applications, and that's, that's, our, that's our purpose. I, I, I understand the concern. I, I want to I wanna move on to another question, but I, but I, but I do want to say that I think that we are all, all of us in this space, are hoping that regulation will become more clear and that the environment will become more welcoming. 
I think that today one of the challenges is that you see um, other territories outside the U.S. moving a little bit quicker in creating a more um, organized regulatory environment, and you see a lot of projects happening outside the U.S. I, I, I think that we're starting to make progress in the U.S. as well. Um, I can tell you that when we were in Japan, we are, um, uh, I, I, I did put a few questions in the chat, basically, for that. Yeah. Anyway, it happened, uh, that was about, yeah, it's still now, so you might know about the school stuff, too, or something like that. So, anyway, that's what happened. It's very interesting. Yeah, it, it's right. And by the way, we're big fans of Economy and we're big fans of Melonport and uh, we, have, um, we have a discussion going on with both of them. I hope that both of them will actually integrate smart tokens into their platforms. Uh, but I think that one of the big differences here is that um, the funds are actually held by the smart contract itself. And the way by the one of the things that happens is when you have a smart token, it has a different price to every one of its reserve currencies. So anytime somebody is going to buy or sell, pull out one of the reserve currencies or add to one of the reserve currencies, it's actually going to change the price of the smart token vis-a-vis -vis its reserve currencies. And this creates actually an arbitrage opportunity for bots to even out the prices if the prices on an external exchange are different from the prices within the smart token. So you can think in many ways that um, arbitrage bots act as kind of oracles for smart tokens to make sure that the prices within the smart token are always aligned with whatever the market prices are outside, the way you would have between two different exchanges that had a discrepancy between them. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. The smart contract acts as sort of an automated market maker. Yeah. Um, so first of all, we're we're still studying Prism. It was released very recently, and so we're we're looking into it, but. I think that um, if, I, if I talk about Shapeshift specifically, the big difference is that Shapeshift uh, matches two parties, right? So even though the process from an end user experience is very simple, right? I send the token and I, or I send the currency and I get whatever other currency. Behind the scenes, what's happening is that there, is, there are two parties who are being matched and an exchange is happening between them. Uh, and, and by the way, we are, we're really excited about the movement from centralized to decentralized exchanges. Those are, I, I think it's great for us as well because our arbitrage bots, um, whenever there's a centralized exchange, we run the risk that the API will be turned off and we won't have access anymore. So the movement to decentralized exchanges I think is wonderful. And I hope that projects like 0x are successful and you know, many different kind of z uh, decentralized exchanges. I think that... Um, what Bancor is actually offering is a new category of exchange. It's not competitive or it's not, uh, it's, it's completely separate from all the exchanges we've seen today because it's what I would think of as an asynchronous exchange, right? It's an exchange in which there aren't two parties being matched in an order book. Uh, you still have the basic market fundamentals of supply and demand, right? So where a smart token will ultimately find um, uh, stability in its price is the overall balance between the number of buys and sells for the token. But they're not happening in real time, they're happening asynchronously over time. 
So we think of Bancor as an entirely new category of, an, of exchanges that's going to also function very well with the existing centralized, uh, uh, traditional exchanges, whether they're centralized or decentralized. You, you wanted to add something? Yeah, about Prism. Yeah. Speak loudly. So, um, you know, from, from just, uh, I would say, uh, the first kind of uh, review of Prism, it seems like uh, they are building a platform for um, uh, user-generated uh, baskets that um, is working with Ether, but essentially collateralized by uh, Shapeshift themselves. So it's a centralized solution in that regard. And uh, I also understood that the fees are not so small, maybe because of that. Uh, what we are offering with with the, the smart tokens is actually a decentralized solution for user-generated token baskets. Now, as long as you have asset tokenizers that tokenize, um, you know, uh, stuff from the outside. Uh, I, mean, I mean, obviously, you can do that for any ERC twenty token. That 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 would work. But if you want to expand beyond ERC-20 tokens, for example, to other cryptocurrencies or other assets like uh, US dollar or oil or what have you, then uh, an asset tokenizer could uh, solve that problem for you and allow you to build decentralized um, token basket, uh, smart tokens uh, on our platform without um, actually having any uh, central control kind of managing or controlling those uh, uh, ETFs. It is possible using smart tokens to define a smart token where the manager of the smart token the, or the admin of the smart token will have rights to change the percentage holding of different assets. So maybe today I want to hold only 5% of Golem in my uh, con uh, uh, basket, but then I want uh, the holding to go up to 10% over the next week. So doing those kind of things is possible. Uh, so it has some central control, but only kind of to configure it. I mean, the central control can, there's no counterparty risk on the admin of, of the smart token kind of taking the funds out. So this is basically uh, how uh, it seems that it's different. Um, while they are managing the hedging and, and, and buying and selling of assets, uh, on this decentralized solution, it, it, it's relying on arbitrage kind of agent or bots, arbitrage bots that are financially incentivized to balance uh, the, the portfolio of the, of the basket because uh, the price, you know, if price are different between markets, this is providing a financial incentive for, uh, for arbitrage uh, bots. So that's, that's basically the difference that we see right now. Yes. Okay, so one, one, one comment on, on your first comment and then I'll ask them the question. You know, I, I started the company Metacafe. Anyone heard about Metacafe? It's like a video website. It's like a little bit older. Uh, yeah. So, um, so when before I started that, I went to the number one uh, intellectual property lawyer in Israel. You know, I, uh, I started in Israel and and he was like the lawyer for all the big record company. And I was telling him, you know, I want to let people upload videos and then people can watch those videos. And well, no, no such site back then. It was way before YouTube, right? Before yeah. <laughs> and, and the lawyer was... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, the, the end of the story is that the lawyer just told me, don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. It's illegal. Don't do it. Yeah. And I did it anyway. <laughs> um, but um, to the, the question was about uh, the, the reserves. So 
what's important to understand about the reserve is that it's actually very connected to how the price is calculated. Maybe we can, uh, if, yeah, if we, we, we yeah, so if we look, look, look at the formula, what we can see here is that the price, is, it's actually, you know, it's actually a simple formula how the price is calculated. The, the, the price is just the reserve balance divided by the supply multiplied multiplied by the CRR the fraction uh, the, the fraction so so what it means is this is how the price is calculated this is how the contract calculate the price of its own token and the price is always denominated in the reserve currency I so I if you have so, so if it's not good no no it can it can it, it can be traded in the exchange no, no, it, it, and it can be, be traded in, in an exchange, but what's important to understand is that it would be as if a token is traded in two exchanges. So if you have Ether trading BTC in two exchanges, you might have different prices, like you would have here. You would have a trade in an exchange. It might be different prices than what the smart contract will give you. And what happens in those cases is that you have arbitrage kicking in because they make money from those differences. So it's okay that it will have differences, it will be self-balanced by the market forces. This is how it works for centuries. And we believe it so will just be more. Hmm? So, so if, the, if the price is, dif is different from an exchange, yeah. so what will happen is that, let's say, uh, the token is cheaper on the smart contract, okay, uh, in, in, in conversion to Ether. And it's cheaper on the smart, it costs less Ether when you buy it from the smart contract than on the marketplace. So arbitrage will actually go to the smart contract. It will buy the token and sell it in the marketplace and buy the token and sell it in the marketplace until the price will even out because as he does that, the price will go up in the contract and down in the marketplace because when, it <laughs> when you do those actions. And this is like the differences that arbitrage bots live upon and, and kind of this is how they make money because there are those differences. Human intervention for what? So, so I, I believe that you know uh, there were there were like just like there are uh, bots that are working today and doing arbitrage in different crypto market today. Um, I believe that they will be here as well, but we will actually make sure that there are bots for the first ones, that there are arbitrage, just in order to balance it. But you know, it's just a matter of incentive, but because, because if the price is too big, uh, the price difference is too big, so you know, you will find the individuals that will just pick the money <laughs> from the floor, I mean, it's, uh, with, with a little bit of work. But uh, when it gets to the bots level, it's kind of a race to the bottom, of who is balancing the prices earlier. So as you get more and more kind of activity, you'll get more and more stability between markets. But you know, it's just a question of how far the prices will go because at some point, someone will just pick the money from the floor and, 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 and enjoy it, right? So, so, um, yeah, so we are we are thinking about how to kind of work with more blockchains. Of course, uh, we see that as kind of a blockchain agnostic uh, system. Uh, uh, we need smart contract to operate well, so that's that's a requirement. Um, but but we also think about solution that will help kind of represent uh, cryptocurrencies from other blockchain on Ethereum and see how we can integrate with that. Uh, additionally, you know, we are all, our background is all kind of end user, consumer applications, and application with millions and tens of millions of users. We're not like uh, the same hardcore technologies that build blockchains, we're building applications. And, and um, from that perspective, what is most important for us is to make a uh, blockchain uh, technology accessible to the end user. And, and, and not just blockchain technology, but also user-generated currencies accessible to the end users. We've been running pilots of, of community currencies, 
all around the world with millions of transactions in the last few years. And the users of those currencies were moms, young moms, and high school kids, and really people that have no idea what's Bitcoin or Ethereum. We don't think that the, the, the any person needs to understand those things more than the, they need to understand what TCP IP is. It doesn't really interesting. Those are like underlying technologies. And what we want to provide is a simple to use product. So I think what you're going to see is more integration with credit card payments um, um, or, 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 or using, you know, using back those tokens in the real world with, uh, for example, our partnership with token card that will allow you just to kind of spend those tokens and uh, at the store when you want to pay for, for your coffee. We want to see uh, a lot of solutions that will make it like easier to trade stuff, like a marketplace that people will be able to kind of post stuff to buy and sell, a business directory. So all co those kind of things that will make it really simple for the end user to get into this world. Uh, forget password. I mean, the guy was mentioning uh, delegated account recovery, security that will really be simple for for people that actually used to do like forgot my password and solve that problem, still don't solve in, 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 in blockchain. So those are the direction that we are kind of focusing on in the next few months. Any more questions? Uh, are you planning uh, token distribution? Yes, we are planning. Uh, like Super dot network. Here is this. Thank you. Thank you very much.